All right, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. We're very excited to bring you this next uh, instance of our Lunch and Learn webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity and cybersecurity from three very different perspectives, one being the asset owner's perspective, one being a cyber physical framework uh, advocate, champion, evangelist, uh, really trying to help the industry as a whole, as well as a technology solutions provider. And we're going to go ahead and kick off by just doing some introductions. I'll start. My name is Tim Vogel. I am with KMC Controls. I am the VP of Connected Solutions, focusing largely on our cloud-based solution for bringing visualization and monitoring to the cloud uh, of your building automation system, but also bringing an interesting and new cybersecurity solution to market as well. Uh, with me, also from KMC, is Dave. Dave, can you give us a little bit of your background and what you do at KMC? I'm uh, Dave Bowman, uh, Vice President of Technology, which is an all-encompassing title. Um, may, I mainly lead the uh, cybersecurity uh, effort that we have here and then also work heavily with Tim with uh, the product line that we've been doing for uh, connectivity and, and IoT and that. I've been with a company for 20 years, and before that, I've been doing or had done uh, uh, defense work and uh, consumer electronics and and also um, uh, commercial uh, satellite and uh, uh, tele-networking uh, projects. Yeah, so. yeah. Dave, you bring a huge amount to our team and a very particular perspective. You're always keeping us honest, particularly on the security side, so thank you for that. <laughs> Lucian, give us a little bit of your background and what you're doing these days. Yeah, Tim, it's great to be back on the podcast with you. I love being able to share insights. So uh, it's a, another fantastic Friday afternoon for us. So Lucian Niemeyer, uh, Air Force vet, uh, spent some time in the United States, spent 11 years on the Senate Armed Services Committee where I really dove into national security issues. Um, and then also more recently as an Assistant Secretary of Defense where I ran all installations, environmental and energy programs for Department of Defense. Currently running a, a nonprofit cybersecurity. I know what you're all thinking, stupidest guy in the world to run a cyber nonprofit. Uh, but the goal is to, to fulfill a, a dream to make the world a safer place. Um, so this nonprofit called buildingcybersecurity.org, check us out, uh, was intended uh, to continue the work that I did in the Department of Defense, looking at the uh, cyber safety of connected technologies. I'm um, in our homes and our cars and in our infrastructure and in our buildings. Um, and Tim, it's been great to work with you over the last couple of years running uh, this nonprofit. Um, KMC is a proud member and our goal really is to establish industry frameworks um, that are easy to use, easy to implement, and ultimately can make uh, each industry uh, more uh, protected um, and, uh, and reduce risk uh, from a range of cyber threats. So great to be here. And it's great to have you. From our perspective, it's been really amazing to watch the last three years or so when nobody had heard about BCS and every conversation we had was, oh, you got to learn more about it. Go to the website, talk to Lucian. Yeah. But now it seems like everybody has heard of building cybersecurity. And if they haven't, then there's so many resources out there for them to go and learn and people to talk to and the community is growing. So we're very, Check very out the excited. Website. Thank you so much. Yes. And then we have Byron Lopez. Byron, tell us about yourself. Morning, everybody. Uh, as Tim mentioned, my name is Byron Lopez. I'm the Director of Operational Technology for Kilroy Realty. And Kilroy is a real estate investment trust. So we uh, maintain, manage, develop uh, buildings on the West Coast and in Texas. We have about 16 million square feet in the portfolio, another couple million square feet currently in, under construction. Uh, and my job is to see everything on the technology side for the buildings. I like to say it's from irrigation to the cloud, right? So everything maintains, supports, operates the systems uh, and wrapping that with a cybersecurity policy to understand that, you know, not only is the technology enabling us to do more cool stuff in the building, but we're also protecting the systems in the building to make sure that our tenants are happy and are not being compromised by somebody who might want to do harm to them. And there's not a shortage of people that are wanting to do harm. Oh yeah. So uh, for some of you in the audience that may have been expecting Yael, she was un, uh, unfortunately unable to make it. And so uh, Byron was here. I, I called it a fourth quarter substitution on my LinkedIn post. Uh, I caught up with him at the Niagara Summit this week, and he's very gracious to give up some time on a Friday uh, to fill in. And I couldn't be more excited to have you here. 
So, Byron, Thank let's you. go ahead and start with you. You talked about those bad guys. You talked about the threats that you're trying to uh, defend against and make sure that uh, you're remaining resilient. Can you tell us about what some of those greatest threats and risks are as you see them for you and Kilroy? Sure. I think one of the biggest pieces in the industry in the whole is the lack of cyber knowledge and cyber awareness, right? I think for for a very long time, uh, if you go into a building, you'll see equipment that's probably older than uh, you know the building that many of us, some of us probably, uh, and that equipment might not be secure, but it's still operating and working, right? So that old adage, if it's not broken, don't fix it but they don't realize that there is a broken cybersecurity policy there, that there's a broken cyber physical security connection there. So making that paradigm shift of understanding that we should be secure by design, not as an afterthought, uh, that we should be bringing in, in building operations, it's always about accessibility, right? That CIHI are backwards. Accessibility, accessibility, I don't care who can get to it as long as I can get to it. We have to make that change. And as we design buildings, technology, we have to start encompassing security into it I think that's one of the biggest risks and understanding that it's not a change for, you know, harm. We're not trying to take anybody's work away. I'm not a controls guy. The last thing I want to do is sit there and, and do a, you know, series of operations design, but I do want to make sure that whoever's doing that does it securely, is in the building securely, and we're doing something smart with the security for the building. So that's the biggest challenge that I think we've been facing. It's slowly getting there with the Niagara summit. I think we had some good conversations. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're still somewhat away uh, until the OEMs start putting more emphasis on it. Then we're still going to have that challenge of, you know, changing the dy dynamic culture of people and understanding cybersecurity. Byron, when you look at who the bad guys are, uh, who, I guess, who do you picture them as? I, I think it's changed, right? We normally think it's a, a guy that's trying to hack us and take over the building and it could be a, a, just as simple as a college student who's doing a project on scanning a building or trying to figure out what's out there. It could be somebody that just stumbled onto something on the internet and, and saw that. Uh, you know, we have a lot of technology savvy tenants, right? It could be somebody who just got bored and wants to figure out what's on the Wi-Fi as engineers and technologists. We're always curious and we're always tinkering. So it's not necessarily somebody who might want to do harm to you on purpose. It could just be somebody that stumbled onto something, uh, decided to do a scan of your network and they didn't know that you know if you continue to stand back it that it will take you down so it's a bit of a mix you do have those individuals who do want to be aggressive who may want to take the building over for some nefarious reason but it could just be as simple as just a college student doing a project and figuring out what you know buildings do so it runs a gamut wow and that's actually a really good insight because you don't hear about that side of it very often is, you know, someone that's maybe not nefarious, but because of the lack of security policies, that's leaving vulnerabilities just for human error. Yeah, right? it could be a technician who's trying to fix something that he saw wrong, right? And he may not have the technology background, right? They're great at doing their building systems, right? Mm -hmm. My security guys, my building BMS guys, they might be trying to solve a problem and make it bigger, uh, or it could just been, you know, a construction process that was never fixed and now you're trying to do that change and you might take something down and, and not understand it. Hmm. That's great. So uh, Lucian, let's turn to you for a second. Let's talk a little bit about frameworks. And you know, he talked about a lot of the issues and threats that can kind of be there, you know, anywhere from nefarious to human error. How is BCS or maybe we go more broad and say frameworks in general, uh, but how is BCS helping to address these issues as you see them? Yeah, so first of all, uh, you know, it was a great uh, question to frame the threat. You know, if you look at the MGM Resorts cyber attack, I mean, I was a 19-year-old kid that uh, just got lucky and uh, and was able to get a ransom out of Caesars, but cost uh, MGM over, what, $150 million, $200 million in recovery costs. So it does run the gamut from nation-state actors to uh, cyber criminals, cyber hackers, and those just looking to have a, a thrill. Um, so how do you how do you cover that full uh, world? Um, when you look at the world of standards and frameworks when it comes to cybersecurity, it's really difficult to use a government standard because the cyber threats evolving all the time. Uh, when I was in the Department of Defense, I found that a lot of what's out there right now is just not effective and efficient for being able to stay on top of a, a fast evolving threat. More importantly is I've chose to focus my life and my passion on the operational technology side there's not a lot of folks who understand that in a building, IT and OT is coming together. 
Um, if anybody's talking you know, air gaps and firewalls, that's like uh, uh, that's safeguards from 15 years ago. The world is converging. IT is converging with OT. So really, when you look at a framework, just not one that covers what I felt adequately. What should a relatively immature market like uh, commercial facilities, which is what we're focused on with the first of our frameworks, um, what should they focus on day to day? Because they are definitely adopting connected technologies across building systems. And when you talk to a building owner, operator, or manager, and you say, do you realize that, you know, based on how you configured your elevator, somebody could easily seize those, and they're just shocked. They don't even understand it. They don't, they don't understand how a cyber attack can have a physical impact. And, and that's really what I'm focused on. You know, we've seen headlines about cyber attacks, uh, uh, stealing data, personal, you know, personal information, um, or, or seizing software for a ransomware attack. Um, I'm laser focused on, you know, what do we need to do for a framework to safeguard human safety? I mean, in other words, to really look at what needs to be designed, secured by design and safe by design when it comes to installing uh, smart technologies in your home or in your car, you know, or, or in a building. We're, we're not there yet. You know, you know a typical car these days has 2,000 microchips in it. Um, and yet there's no dashboard light that says, hey, someone, someone's messing with your data. You need to pull over. I mean, these are the basic safety things that we are not looking at as a society. So I established uh, my nonprofit to create that performance framework for a series of industries, starting with commercial buildings. What is an easy to use checklist? Um, there's probably not a lot of folks on this call or, or outside the world oil and gas who know what the OT standard uh, ISA 62443 is. Um, but that's the goal is to take that global a technology standard, build a performance framework around it, and then offer it to industries that, like Byron said, can't even spell cybersecurity, let alone know what the risk is to, to their data, to their business, but more importantly, to their tenants, to their occupants, to their employees, and what that physical risk is, not just a phishing attack that creates an IT uh, dilemma, but where a nefarious action can unintentionally create in a, a catastrophic environmental uh, problem, similar to like what happened with Colonial Pipeline. The pipeline mm -hmm. had to be shut down, even though it was an IT attack, because there was a concern that it migrated to the smart valves and smart meters, which could have had a catastrophic environmental impact. So that's that's the world I'm living in, where the cyber physical, where you can actually hurt somebody, cause property damage. Our framework is unique in that, in addressing that threat for industries, other than oil and gas and, and, and power, that don't aren't really looking at it. Uh, that way and really need an easy to use guide, uh, an assessment tool and a certification tool. How do I mitigate risk immediately? And that's what we're working on. Yeah, and the pipeline example is even more painful because they were in the middle of a cybersecurity upgrade <laughs> on the OT yep. side. Yep. Um, you know, you talk about human safety, huge thing. What about corporate espionage? We see that as a, as a big issue. Of course. I mean, that's that's that, you know, we are we are information, intellectual property, uh, private information is a has been the, the uh, predominant target uh, for ransomware and for nation states. Um, and only recently have we seen uh, uh, nation states move from stealing data to actually threatening systems. Um, yeah. Hopefully everybody here on the call and, and, and the country has heard of old typhoon by now. Um, and that's a new type of, of nation state attack where they are uh, preparing to sabotage critical infrastructure, going after those industrial control systems. You read the headlines coming out of Mandian, CrowdStrike, uh, uh, Microsoft, others. They are, they are really concerned now that you have a range of actors, not just nation states, focused on what used to be uh, corporate uh, IP and corporate data. Now they're focused on how can they uh, disrupt, dismantle, or, or deny a, a critical systems and create a, a very unsafe uh, activity. And that's, you know, that's, you know uh, FBI Director Chris Ray was just talking about that yesterday mm -hmm. down in Nashville about how we have a new threat, uh, threat vector um, that is uh, directly targeting our way of life and our critical life-saving uh, uh, utilities and systems. So Dave, this comes to you. Like Lucian <laughs> says, Byron was saying, these threats are increasing, they're changing in their velocity and what they're trying to do, what they're trying to accomplish, the harm they're trying to cause. You're a CISSP. Uh, there's, a, there's a small group of people, so you're more technically knowledgeable than I would say most, and uh, your credentials and background obviously prove that. But when it comes to technology being applied 
uh, particularly when we look at trying to apply the benefits of a framework. Um, how is that technology affecting real change or reducing these real risks? Yeah, it, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of technology out there and it keeps getting better as the threats uh, change as well. But, um, you know, as Byron mentioned, one of the, one of the key things still today is educating people and you can use some good technologies to help automate that during phishing campaigns and cyber awareness and, and they can do it well where people still get engaged and interested and then become much more aware of what's really out there. Um, something like, I think it's almost half of the successful uh, breaches in an enterprise come from social engineering and that's just straight general cyber hygiene. You know, do not click on that link in that. But you have to keep people engaged and become more aware of uh, making sure that they're um, uh, you know, doing what needs to be done. Um, and there's uh, other tools too, and still they're, they're already out there for uh, penetration testing, vulnerability, and, and auditing and that. There's, there is so much work that needs to be done to maintain a good uh, cybersecurity posture. And you need those tools to be able to help um, be able to do all that, a lot of that work very efficiently and and drill down into what, what could be happening in that. Um, penetration testing, a lot of times I think people think about the, the, the wall, the firewall between the building and the outside, but there's still uh, a lot of penetration testing that can be done with the tools for the inside. Um, a lot of um, a lot of breaches for uh, OT happen inside, either from a, a you know, somebody that's a disgruntled uh, employee, like maybe me at times, you know, but uh, no, or just people misconfiguring things, right? Um, another part of that too is part of the uh, pen testing and that is since we're becoming more and more uh, remotely connected and that those tools help to, to find those holes um, with the remote connectivity and also to help maintain your access control lists. And the tools there too help you with the paperwork, just help you keep on going on when people leave or people come on board, what exactly do they have access lists and you keep keep up that work. So the, the tools are, are they're there um, now and they keep changing and, and improving as time goes on too. Hey, hey, can I jump on that real quick, Tim? Because I think the most the most important thing, there's a ton of tools out there. Um, there's a ton of capabilities. There's a lot of companies that want to sell you their, you know, their capability. Um, really, for anybody, particularly an immature uh, uh, person, uh, uh, a company that hasn't really looked at cybersecurity, you've got to start with a risk assessment. You have to ask yourself, okay, what's the most critical impact to my company or, or to my employers or to my brand or to my business operation? Um, and when, if you start and you can do an honest risk assessment, starting with life safety, health impacts, but going on to business disruption and other, that's going to drive you. OK, now I know what I, where I have potentially an existential threat to my company. What what tools can I use? And it may not be pen testing. It may be, you know, just constant monitoring or it may be just be mm. some front end protection or even understanding inventory of, of what I, the OT I have on my system, which is a shock to every CISO and CIO I've ever talked to when they realize they've got hundreds of OT devices that potentially have unguarded vectors coming into their network. Yep. So really, yeah. you do have to start with two things, a risk assessment and an inventory to really so you're not spending money on things that ultimately may not be important. And look, the, the, the facility owner that's putting Amazon 2 in their buildings is going to be different from a facility owner that's got, uh, you know, storage uh, for, you know, equipment storage. So, yeah, it, depending on the mission uh, of, 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 uh, of a company and what they're trying to do and what they needed to protect themselves, then that really, uh, that, that risk assessment is important. So Byron mentioned earlier CIA. And Dave, uh, one of the issues that we always talk about is balancing security with usability. Talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, almost every endeavor in engineering, there's a balance of sorts. But for um, you have the CIA, triad, and IT, which is confidentiality, integrity, and accessibility. And a lot of um, 
OT systems, accessibility needs to take priority because you have to get to your system in that. There are some few uh, uh, kind of outlier cases where accessibility is so important, they don't even use passwords because when there's a fire going on in that, you can't be thinking about your password in that. So the CIA triad kind of gets turned upside down to AIC and some things, you know, different aspects of integrity or confidentiality can um, uh, kind of push up against accessibility. So you have to really balance your needs, your requirements, and what you're doing for the building and that. Um, and then with uh, in OT circles, we, we tend to also add safety as the very first leg of the triad. So it's really safety, accessibility, integrity, and, and confidentiality. So, um, but each system's different. And I was going to say too, each, each framework's kind of different too. It's not a one size fits all. That's why I really like the BCS where it's really focused on what we're trying to do in OT. There's a lot of overlap in the frameworks, but you really have to you know, know your system, know your requirements and what your risks are. This past week, I mentioned I was at Niagara Summit. I did a short 13 minute recording with Fred Gordy of Michael Baker International. And he made me laugh because he said, you know, typically in a building system, it's A, I, and the C is <laughs> over here on the floor. Like, you know, you forgot to even like put it up on the board. And, uh, but yeah, it, the idea of confidentiality then flows into this idea of zero trust and how in the world do you manage something that's zero trust while maintaining the openness and interoperability of these primary protocols that are used like BACnet? And the industry is trying to figure that out. It is a challenge. It is difficult. Um, but ultimately it comes down to just knowing you have to do it. And it is really that important. Now, knowing you have to do it then comes down to prioritization. So Byron, from your perspective, when you look at budgeting and perhaps not specifically you or your company but you could look at the industry as a whole even how are asset owners changing the way they approach cybersecurity threats utilizing technology and let's also mention what lucian said doing those assessments i think the assessment piece is critical right that threat appetite that you have as an organization figuring out what is right in, in these times you know you have to figure out there's so many solutions and there's so many dollars that you have to spend, right? And everything's going, you said you used to install it and forget it. Now you have to continuously monitor it, upgrade it. It's a, it's an OPEX cost versus a CAPEX cost. So understanding what your threat appetite is, is it your brand recognition? Is your brand going to be hurt if somebody has an issue within your building? Is a, a uh, you know, organizational recognition issue or is it a requirement from a government agency that's giving you an assessment saying, we want to be in your building, but we need this, this and this. So you have to understand where your building sits, uh, what pieces are critical, right? One of the big things that we always prioritize is network infrastructure for the building, right? As Lucian is saying, things are converging. IT is becoming part of OT, OT is becoming part of it. But you have to make sure that you have a strong foundation that you can then deploy all these security policies, all these technology implementations, that you have a foundation of trust that you can then put the bells and whistles on top of that, right? Everybody talks about indoor air quality, occupancy, AI, but if you don't have that infrastructure, that layer of security that can then allow you to have accessibility to the systems, can then control access for people to be able to view the information and sharing the data, that's very important. So for us, it was a, how do we lay the foundation for our assets across the board and then mm -hmm. figure out the technology that we have vetted from a cybersecurity standpoint, not just because it's a cool and funky thing to do, but it has a foundation of security built into it and then can do the cool and sexy things that we wanted to do later. So that's how we prioritize technology and looked at it from a portfolio standpoint, not just a building, because then we can then leverage our scale and say, oh, vendor A, you can't do that, but vendor B can. And hopefully that vendor A will now go back, talk to their team, say, how can we make changes to our security standpoint so that we can hopefully work with, you know, a Byron, a, you know, another company within my industry and, and move us forward together, not as individuals. So, so real quick, uh, Tim, that's like the dream of Aaron just express, you know, okay, all these control sets, you know, the investments levels approved all the way up to the mm -hmm. CFO, the CEO. Um, unfortunately, a CISO or a CEO has got to fight or a CTO has got to fight for these, uh, these additional investments. Uh, I'm a big believer in we've got to change the discussion on overall risk. 
you know, right now, historically, a company does three things when they assess risk. They mitigate it, they assume it, or they transfer it to insurance. Um, when we're talking cybersecurity, I really need the industry, and I think we all do, start talking cyber safety. When mm -hmm. you start talking cyber safety, you're talking about a standard of care. Every engineer and building operator and owner understands safety for that building. There, that's a that's a got to have. That is not like an optional investment. You've got to have occupant safety. So I've been a big push nationally, and Tim would love to talk more about this. I think you need to create a whole series on cyber safety, which is what do we need to do to uh, starting in the engineering schools to create a standard of care that we have a cybersecurity engineer that has a professional licensing requirement, like a mechanical or electrical, mm -hmm. that ultimately can stamp, you know, whether it's a drawing or a digital twin for cyber safety, because they've designed the back net and all the data architecture in that building to be protected, whether it's sensors, whether it be other mechanisms. And then that standard of care is translated over to building operations. Until we get to that point, when this is no longer an optional program, this is mandatory, we're going to continue to struggle as an industry to make our point that, you know, that, that cybersecurity needs to be addressed in every aspect of building ownership, operations, construction, design. It's a cultural shift for sure, right? Within us, we had to have a cultural shift where mm -hmm. my team now sits with construction, sits with our engineering team. We designed the building with technology in mind and our teams are dedicating, you know, what conduit we're using, what low voltage is going in there, what switches are being managed by the building and who has that control so that the control guys are just doing controls, not the network security part, right? Because that's not their bread and butter, right? They're great at automating the building but our teams are responsible for the cybersecurity implementation in conjunction with them. And it's a cultural shift for sure. You stole one of my follow-up questions for later on in the conversation around how do you work well with multiple stakeholders in a cross-functional sense? And uh, so just continuing that line of thought, Byron, what makes that work well? Like what's the, what's the trick or the key in, in changing the culture in that direction? Uh, we establish what we call an innovation council, right? Head of engineering, head of sustainability, head of physical security with IT, working together to understand our challenges across the board, right? Drinks help as well, right? Having dinners and drinks and understanding each other's challenges, I think has always been a good piece of moving forward, but it's really understanding that we're here as ITOT to help the departments do their goals, meet their needs, because they all have different technology challenges. They're great at their building pieces. They're great at the physical security side, but the technology may not be their strong suit. So I will partner with my head of physical security to identify what NVRs, what cameras, what cabling, what switches, what AI functions we're gonna put on top of that. So working as what we call the one killer team, right? Making sure that we're all pulling together because at the end of the day, it's it, it wasn't Byron who got hit or this, it was Kilroy or it was you know whoever that other organization might be we're all responsible for it. And that's the biggest piece that we're pulling together as a team and relying upon each other. Yeah, could, could I uh, add one point to that? It's a technology registry. I think what you're discussing, all the control sets, both the building systems, but also what does the owner want to put in that building? Mm -hmm. You got to build that tech registry. So, so an engineer or a team is looking at the complete suite of technologies that's going to be uh, a part of the building operation, as well as the, the, the smart TVs, all the things yep. that are going in the building. And then you, so you can look at it holistically and build a standard of care around that tech registry or yep. that tech list. We call it the killer matrix, basically. You go in that matrix and you choose a list of all the different solutions. And that's what has been vetted, approved, and negotiated as a rate because of our, our size, right? So that's, that's the killer way. And is that, uh, is that matrix in terms of a chart or matrix in terms of like Keanu Reeves? And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one day maybe you'll put in the Google view, right? The Apple view and you'll be, plan. yeah, but it's <laughs> no, right now it's just a catalog of everything that is approved and used. And, you know, who do you go for? If this camera breaks down, what are you going to replace it with? Or from, yeah. from everything from irrigation to the cloud. That's great. Oh. Go ahead, Dave. Uh, you know, supply chain is a big part of it too. So how do you vet, you know, how do you normally go off and vet your different suppliers and that? I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the old, you know, target breach from 20, what was it, 2013. It was not a building automation system that got breached, but a BAS company in that. And that's, that's part of everybody has to be on board with this. But so you need programs 
with the building owners and, and really taking the, the lead, I think, with all their suppliers and vendors to make sure we're all on board. Lucian, in the BCS framework, is there something about vendor selection or supply chain? Yeah, it is. It's more, uh, again, I, I have to be careful. I don't necessarily say don't buy from certain vendors, right. um, but it, look, the, 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 we have partnered with ISA, International Society of Automation, uh, and their framework, which is about using ISA secure technologies. Um, and they go through a whole process where they say, okay, this, this uh, technology, whether it be an HVAC system or whether it be a, a camera system, has a degree of security. I'm not as worried about what the manufacturer is. I know others are, uh, but our framework says, okay, for these capabilities, here are the things you want to see for protections. I'm more interested in the, uh, in the machine human interface on, on what do we need to do to protect from, if there is a bad actor acting, how do you let somebody know? Um, but I do agree. Uh, look, in my former life, we spent a lot of time on supply chain uh, uh, risk uh, particularly uh, with certain uh, countries requiring certain companies to put things in their in their equipment, and we're definitely aware of that. Um, I, I tried to be agnostic a little bit to that because of the fact that I don't want to create a gigantic list of things you that nobody should do. We'll let we'll let others uh, provide that list. Yeah, I think from a manufacturing perspective, not necessarily KMC's perspective, but all meant because everything we do is made in America. But for many manufacturers across the gamut of all building systems uh that that's a heavy lift to have to go back and review everything that's in the bomb mm -hmm. to make sure you, you understand in where it is and i know there's yeah, some other it's to escaping the me. software you have to mm -hmm. include the software it's yeah. not just the hardware but you know you, you have to source out where that software came from too and look the, the, the nation's trying to do that secure by design is mainly a software principle but we, we need to apply it to hardware as well uh, but it's it's a difficult task uh, to yeah. to certify that you you know where every code you know and every every piece came for that system. Um, it's difficult. Keeping on the supply chain vendor management side, Byron, what are some ways that Kilroy tries to mitigate against maybe some of those risks? I, I think one of the biggest pieces is communication and understanding what projects you have in your pipeline and where that aligns with your suppliers, right? Uh, during COVID, right, we saw some of those timelines change from, you know, a couple of months to a couple of years and equipment was hard to come by and you had to figure out what am I going to replace this with? And if I'm in a time crunch, do I go to somebody else who might have equipment available, but may not be as secure? And that's where you have to make the decision of what's, you know, where are your tiers? You can't say I'm only a class A equipment buyer, right? I have to be able to say, well, a minus class or B class, right? What pieces of equipment do I lose? What functionalities can I, you know, give up and still provide that layer of security? So during that time, we had to take a look at, you know, network infrastructure. If you're talking about Cisco and all their lines, right? Their equipment was taking so long that you had to be able to adjust and, and figure out, well, maybe we go with another class of the Cisco model, or maybe we go with a different device with the Cisco brand. What do we give up? So talking to them, understanding their challenges and understanding where you're coming from and being able to do a long term planning. That's one of the things that we, we like to do every year. We meet with all of our suppliers, all of our vendors, have a physical sit down and say, this is what we're doing. This is where we're looking to go. How does your pipeline look like? Are we going to be having are we going to have any problems? And then make sure that we're all aligned, right? Because at the end of the day, we like building partnerships, long-term partnerships. Uh, because of our size, we're able to provide and say we're not one, two C buildings here. It's it's the portfolio that's going to get that solution. So, uh, working with them to understand that we are a top-tier customer, but we also prioritize our security piece and where we're going from that, and having the foresight to be able to say we will be there in a year, two years. We need to start ordering equipment now or in six months or whatever that's going to be to meet those challenges because we also develop. Uh, and the other thing is when we acquire is understanding what's in the building, right? Doing an assessment, not just buying a building, just, I mean, we're in the business of buying and selling, but going out there, having our teams review the building, understanding what's currently in the system. How do we get it from a standpoint where it might not be the killer standard, but how do we get there? How do we get to that process to make sure that it does have that killer quality services that we want to put together for, for all of our customers? Okay, I think we could probably stick on this topic for a lot longer, but I have other things I want to talk about. And what you just said was something that I think segues into my next question, which will ultimately be for Lucian. But let's go back to you, Byron. 
you talked about your strategy is to buy and sell and doing an assessment is important for that. So we've talked about risk. Uh, Lucian, you laid out, you know, the companies either mitigate, they assume, or they transfer over to insurance. But Byron, in a buy-sell environment, how does the value of an assessment or understanding the cybersecurity threat landscape in a particular building or a portfolio, how does that affect and bring value to that kind of buy-sell strategy? I think at least for me, it just makes it easier for me to be able to go out and put a plan together for the property, right? If I understand what I'm going to be asked to do with that building, right? Because at that point, our team has already done the due diligence. They've done all the financial side, right? So uh, we're now looking at how do we provide a operational efficiencies point? Right? It's more about being efficient in operating our teams. Mm -hmm. uh, if we buy a building in a certain region, some property managers might decide to move to that location. Our engineering team might decide to relocate to that space. So having consistency across the board, knowing that they're always going to use the same OT access tool to promote into the building, knowing that they're always going to have the same type of firewalls in the building. How do we make sure that that standard from an operation side is applied to the new asset that we're buying? Or how do we make sure that that new purchase, right? If we're setting up a building that we're buy, we're giving that new buyer a property that we feel proud of. And hopefully as they see our setup, they might want to use that going forward. They might see that, oh, right. Kilroy provided us a full network infrastructure for every building system in the building, every solution point, every device. This is how we manage it. Maybe we can talk to them about how do we do that as part of their own buildings going forward. So hopefully changing the culture, not just for Kilroy, but for the industry as well and sharing with our peers. So I think it builds more sustainable processes for everybody and we grow together because we don't want to be just, you know, it's great that we have great buildings, but we want to make sure that the industry also moves forward together from a technology standpoint. Uh, what a, I mean, it's almost like a, a charitable point of view. I mean, it's this long-term broader vision and what you're doing. You're not just affecting your company, but you really see what you're doing as affecting others and encouraging others to be better as well. And that's that's amazing. Yeah, I think for us, right, we are in the business of leasing space, right? We want to make sure people come to us and are happy mm -hmm. and, and sign long-term leases. But we also want to make sure that, you know, we provide that efficiency for other people that might be gaining because we are partners, right? I might talk to a CTO or CISO at another company and they might share what they're doing. And my, I might not have thought about that and we grow together. So it's one of those things which you're able to leverage partners and relationships uh we are competitors but we are also colleagues on the technology side so that's that's mm -hmm. one of the things that i value as well yeah it is an interesting market all right so that's a little bit about value uh you know value for you value for the industry would you say and again i'm not asking for numbers but would you say like handing over a more secure building increases the value of the property oh yeah I think 100 percent you're not only bringing security to your own personnel, but also providing it for your tenants. Right. They might have questions or they might have heard a buzzword. They might have heard, you know, digital twinning or secure access, and they might have those questions and not understand it. So you're able to sit down with that lease person and say, this is what we do. What are you asking me for? You're asking for tenant self-management on the access control side. Okay, mm -hmm. we can do that because we have these policies, the system, the solution, right? You might be saying, well, I want to integrate my AI chatbot with your BMS too, so that when my tenants are hot or cold, they can go on the computer and just chat with them. Well, you know, there's some challenges. Who do you want to use? Well, that's, you know, that, that solution has been banned by the US. You may not know that, right? So it helps us work with that tenant and give them the infrastructure that they might need to be successful and provide services to them. So. It brings operational efficiency for our teams, but also becomes a lease negotiation or question that we can then help them understand what they're really asking for. Because they might be a you know a law firm that has very high security policies, and they mm -hmm. might ask you for a specific thing that you might not have or you may have, and that can make a difference in you know signing that lease or, or not. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that we've we've been able to see. At least I've been able to see as as a growth efficiency. So we have about five minutes left. I want to stay on this value conversation. Lucian, uh, we'll go to you. A, a couple of things real quick, Tim, because you've yeah. got some great questions coming into the chat. I just want oh, to sure. make sure you're tracking that. Um, I and we definitely, there's a couple of things I want to get across or at least offer up for the group here um, before we finish out. So Yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead and jump in on the one that, that you find uh, most intriguing. Well, it's it, it's probably the hardest thing to deal with. And that's what Jeffrey said is, how do you deal with insider attack, particularly when it comes to OT? And you know, that's really difficult, particularly somebody who's got credentials. 
Um, and it, it is really difficult to be able to fight that. And, and, and a disgruntled employee is, is probably the worst threat as far as being able to combat that. Um, and really, on the OT side, all you can do is try to maximize uh, the, or the safety associated with the control rooms, uh, making sure that uh, access to sensitive uh, equipment, uh, whether it be boilers, HVAC, fire controls, or access control themselves, um, that, the, that the remote or the, or the automated access, or not automated, but the uh, wireless access is restricted. Um, and so you can take certain st steps that are within our framework um, uh, that uh, yeah, as you rise up to a bronze level, silver level, those, those uh, ratchet up as far as the uh, improvements you can make to a facility design in operation to kind of uh, um, at least minimize access to those. Uh, but somebody that's got uh, credentials who, who ends up wanting to do bad things, unfortunately, is going to be able to do bad things. The only thing you can do there is maybe implement AI uh, protections that, um, that see a, a non-standard data input uh, from somebody who has not input into it and, and put an alarm out there. That's about as far as I think we can go right now. I mean, as, as AI matures, I think we'll have a little bit more ability to do machine learning applications where a machine will know, hey, I've never received an input from this person before. I'm going to go ahead and check it before I actually execute it. Uh, but we're still on the, in, the, in the infancy stages of that. Byron, I'm not sure if you want to add anything to that from your perspective. No, I think that those are great points, right? If you have somebody who's a trusted partner who has all the keys to the kingdom, because at the end of the day, we have to trust, right? Our operators, our implementers, our, our vendors. And you, of course, can try to do something with legal contracts and negotiations as to what might happen if they're responsible for that. But at the end of the day, you can't bubble everything up and, you know, provide that physical change, right? I wish we could just put a bubble there and a shield and you have to do more systems, but when you trust that vendor and that vendor has credentials or passwords or can do changes on your behalf, then you're, you're up to them and having a trust relationship with them is very essential. Yeah. Dave, you're the expert on this. What, you know, what do you think? As you know, it's a tough, that's a tough uh, vector um, to deal with. Yeah. It, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of due diligence work. You know, if you have an employee that leaves or with a vendor, you just always have to, and to make sure you're maintaining your access list, of course, and, and everybody has the, the proper uh, level or permission and know more than what they really need in that. But I think you're you're right too. AI is a big thing uh, that you know, as that matures, we're going to be able to use that to leverage you know what to find uh, instances of people using the system that did not you know, normally have done that before. You know, kind of outside normal access and that, but. It's a, it's a, a hard thing. I think it, it also comes down to building out a zero trust, a, a zero trust system, you know, a, almost a multi-factor approval uh, for some of these more critical systems also. Yep. That's uh, definitely, a, 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 that should be a standard feature, right? Any, any non-standard input has to be uh, checked or double checked. Yeah. And especially, uh, too, we've had conversations internally about the ability to, uh, it goes back to the psychological operation or, or you know, human behavioral manipulation. If I get a phone call from who I think is my boss telling me to do something, and that's his voice that I'm hearing, you know, how, how do you build in a policy where I'm comfortable saying, Hey, Lucian, I'm pretty sure this is you, but I need you to check your app and tell me what the keyword is so that I know. Yeah, or, or send me an email or send me a text yeah. to confirm what right. you just uh, what you just asked me to do over the phone, something like that. Yeah, yeah. which then yep. goes back to what we've talked about several times around training and around uh, just informing people and giving them. Hey, a really hey change we're there now. Out. I mean, some of the emails, the phishing emails and the emails from in are so realistic. You, you've got to come up with a way to validate and verify. Hey, uh, we're running out of time, and I, and, but I want to throw a suggestion out for Dave and Tim. Um, we need to do another lunch and learn on the concept of cyber commissioning. I think, Byron, you probably would want to mm -hmm. be a part of this. That is an emerging uh, 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 career field yeah. and task. We need to talk about what is needed in the commissioning process for either modernization, new construction, or even existing facilities, and really dive into the details. How do you do an effective cyber commissioning um, uh, and, you know, addition, uh, in addition to the standard building commissioning. So I know we're out of time. I want to get that concept in there. I want to throw a marker down, Tim. I think that'd be great for KMC to dive into that as well. I think it's great. Okay, so if you are an audience member, I want you to email me, tvogel at kmccontrols.com if you think that's a great idea 
and we'll make sure that you're on the mailing list to let you know that it's going to happen. Watch out for LinkedIn. I think that would be wonderful and amazing. And we are at time. So Lucian, Dave, Byron, thank you guys so much. Really appreciated this conversation. Everyone listening, have a great rest of your day, a great weekend. And if you have any questions, reach out to any of us anytime. Appreciate you all. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.